How's the day going for you guys? I'm the one standing between Jeff's talk, which I also want to attend, you know, <laughs> and uh, so so we'll wrap it up quickly. Probably uh, we'll do more Q&A uh, and less this. So uh, it's a pretty interesting topic. Uh, first disclaimer, I'm not a designer. Uh, so, you know, the topic you, you know, saw is little, you, you could mix up design with innovation, but still hold true. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a lot of biases uh, that come into play when we make decisions around product, features, design. Uh, and uh, if there is a way to sort of overcome that, but I'm, I'm sure at the end of it, uh, I'll be looking for more ideas how to overcome, you know, some of those and Linda is right here uh, to give us some pointers. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, something that I came across, uh, you know, I read a book called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. How many of you have read the book? Okay, cool. So which very, very, you know, it's sort of fascinating. Then I followed up with another book, which is called Art of Thinking Clearly, Rock the Belly, which is again, so I'm sort of getting hooked into this concept and which, you know, and over a period of time, as I start learning about it, uh, you know, just reading about it, I realize that I think my thinking is you know, slightly changing and, uh, you know, you're able to, you know, question it. So that's a quick share of, uh, you know, what I have found so far. All right. So how many decisions do we make in a day? Any idea how much, you know, decisions, you know, your brain makes? Uh, so uh, rough calculation, you know, a lot of reports is 32,000. We don't think about it, you know, right from brushing our teeth to, you know, at work. Uh, there are a whole bunch of decisions, you know, which are being played. But how many do we, you know, take, you know, do we think that we are a rational decision makers? I'm sure our bosses think that way, right? You know, especially in appraisals, you know, right there. Uh, and how many of you think you are biased in your decision making? Oh, nice. So, uh, you know, obviously, uh, this is, uh, one of the study which was done is, uh, you know, when they conducted and says, okay, uh, how many of you are more biased than the average person and only one out of 600 said, you know, that I'm more biased, uh, but otherwise everything, no, I'm biased, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing good for now. Cool. So, uh, I mean, I, you know, most of you have read the book, but uh, a lot of this is about the system one, system two thinking. So Daniel Kahneman, one of the you know Nobel Prize winners, uh, he studied, uh, you know, uh, behavioral science and came with this whole concept that our brain has two parts to it, system one. And system two. System one is more uh, also called as reflexive brain, and system two is reflective. So if you are brushing our teeth, we're not thinking about it. So system one is at play; you're just automatically, you know, doing it. Uh, so you could think as, uh, you know, sort of anything that you're doing without thinking about it, driving, brushing your teeth, uh, you know, any sort of acts, all that is system one. Uh, anything where you have to think hard, you know, write a, you know, think of an idea, solve a problem, write algorithm, is system two. Uh, so in some way. System one is fast, un, you know, unconscious, automatic, you know, and all the everyday decision, but that is also error prone. So, you know, because, you know, brain is taking a lot of decisions at a very fast place, there are tons of errors, uh, you know, that, that come into play. And we're going to talk, you know, some of those uh, as, as I've studied. Uh, system two is slow, you know, more, uh, you know, conscious, you know, it takes a lot of effort, it drains you out. So after a long meeting, whole day, when you have been thinking about, you know, workshops or brainstorming with your team, you're pretty much tired and that point of time it starts to, you know, go off and suddenly, you know, that you, you start to, you know, drain yourself out. So almost 95% of the decisions that we take you know, are done by system one and not by system two. Even though if you, if you, if you just think back the amount of effort you, you know, put in at work and maybe, you know, all the pay, it's, it's much more than that. So obviously a lot of time you're making decisions from system one, uh, which is not accurate and therefore we have anxiety, we have you know, tons of issues all around in society. Uh, so how do we sort of, so this is the term which is called cognitive bias, which is nothing but when the brain is using system one, it is, you know, it tends to do a bunch of errors. Uh, then that errors, just like our code, uh, you know, leads to a lot of issues. And that is what typically is referred as cognitive bias. It's also sort of a, a mental shortcut that our brain makes, uh, you know, to deal with the problem at hand. And we'll uh, quickly see what problem. In some way, I mean, that's my uh, way of remembering. Uh, do you know, you know, I'm sure for others, what's Indian Jugar? Uh, Jugar is a hack, uh, which we Indians find out to just solve a particular problem. So to me, you know, a cognitive bias is nothing but a, a Jugar that brain finds to deal with a, a certain set of problems, right? Uh, so how many Jugar does brain have? Or, or the biases? So there's, uh, there, are, there are four you know, type of problem that the brain deals with and, uh, you know, and therefore he has a, you know, a brain has a jugar or a shortcut to deal with. One, too much of information, right? I mean, all around we have tons of information, you know, lying around. 
So, uh, you know, how does brain deal with all of that? You know, it's, it's an overload. So, obviously, it plays some shortcuts to make some, you know, some sort of sense. Uh, not everything has a meaning, you know, I mean, or context. You don't fully know about, you know, all the information. There are bits and pieces that you know. So, now it has to connect the big picture and at least retain something. So, it again makes some shortcut. Uh, and that shortcut does not, you know, fully accurate. Uh, it needs to act fast in most of the situation. So, you know, and then it again applies some shortcut. How do I... You know, if I'm if I'm driving through, uh, I might not have looked on the left, but you'll still feel that you know something was there. You know, so what's the shortcut? You know, that it has to to make sense of the environment, and what all to remember. You know, I'm sure you can't remember everything. Uh, so if you look back, you will have some memories in childhood, but not all. Uh, so there are some selective pieces that it remembers, and that also has some shortcuts of you know what to remember, what not to remember. Now. There are about 186 biases, you know, on Wikipedia out there. And it's impossible for anyone to sort of recall all of this. So uh, I recently came across, you know, uh, one guy called, uh, uh, you know, Benson. So he basically has taken all 186 biases, sort of done a dedupe for, you know, most of them and came up into four of these broad buckets and says, you know what, more or less, this is the problem brain is solving. And these are the biases which more or less you could just, you know, understand uh, about this. We'll quickly go through some of those uh, and, uh, you know, and see. Uh, as I go through the bias, I'll probably, you know, throw in some examples of, you know, how we've been dealing at, you know, at work, at, at, uh, at the products that we build and uh, how could sort of we started to change a little bit thinking in the teams uh, that we have. Cool. So first one, too much of information, right? So, you know, what Jugar can brain do, right? The first one is we notice things that are already primed in the memory. Okay. That's the first thing, you know. The, the brain does so because there's too much of information anything which is recent you will know so example if you've bought a car suddenly you realize oh you this model is what is popular you know i think because everyone has it uh, i remember my wife was pregnant and every time we used to roam around she says you know what why is it like suddenly everyone in the world is you know having babies right so it, it's just that those memories are primed and therefore you tend to see those more at work the same thing goes you're a product manager you spoke to one customer last week and he gave you a bunch of feedback and you go to a next planning meeting and say, you know what, that customer is giving me this feedback. This is, should be really important, though it may not be, right? Uh, so you suddenly tend to lose the rationale and, and put those recent things out uh, and you start elaborating, you know what, I was speaking to the customer, this is what happened uh, and that, that bias is at play. So the moment you know this, you will know that bias is at play and then you start questioning, okay, do you have data on that? Uh, all right, how many times, how many other customers have the same problem? So you start sort of dealing with that and, and that's something we have done. Uh, so some of my product managers who have now trained in, I've just took them through this biases and suddenly, you know, when we go in the room before anything, we says, okay, is there any bias? And then everyone tries to recall, oh, I think this is availability bias right there. Uh, you know, so because some customers were speaking, therefore, let me go back and research more and, and, and then get back whether we should do it or not. Brain remembers the other, you know, Jugar. They own, you know, brain remembers the most bizarre or, you know, sort of, visually striking thing that you could do and that is what marketers play on they make the visuals so different uh, that you will remember the the very different ad which was there and not you know everything that you do right so so this is also one of the ways that uh, since brain has a bias and, and you know marketers also know about it how do you tap on to that and leverage it to your you know favor so when you're designing product if it's visually more appealing uh, certain screens obviously it'll have more longer effect so you could definitely leverage you know so those uh, uh, you know, mental biases Anyone knows what is the bias at play here? So most of the pricing menu, if you see, you've seen three or four combos. So that's also one of the way mental, you know, shortcut is anchoring. So when you do a negotiation, you know, with even your, you know, your grocery guys, so he will throw you a price. Uh, and, and, you know, negotiation one-on-one, -on -one, you know, sort of has classes that anyone who sets the anchor first, you're negotiating for your salary. Whoever throws that number first, that anchors what will happen next. So, you know, that much leverage you have. And based on the anchor, you know, then you know, the whole negotiation will start. So, this is nothing but what price do we want to sell it to the customer? Now, obviously, if we just give him one, uh, I think the, the anchor is set, but I think people will not be satisfied because there are other biases at play. So, they will look for more options. So, therefore, you throw him, you know, some pseudo options right there. Uh, ultimately, he's going to go for this anyways. So most of the pricing pages, if you look at some of the plan, at least the, you know, thoughtfully designed one, 85% of them are right, visually highlighted right there. So there's two things, anchoring and contrast. 
both biases at play and therefore they design the whole screen uh, that way. Uh, contrast is also you know similar one. Uh, so we basically are noticing anything which is changing, right? So you you know you you run your hand in the cold water and put it into the hot water. Suddenly the hot water will feel you know in a in a different temperature. Even the temperature has not changed. It's just the contrast you know you've done. I mean, there's a joke which goes: uh, if you're going to date, uh, never take you know the friends who are more beautiful than you or handsome than you. Uh, otherwise, your chances of date is you know totally gone because there will be a contrast bias. You know, so if you're a room full of you know handsome, good-looking people, you might seem little more average. You know, even though you're not. Right. Cool. Quick question. So, what is the answer for this? So if a card has a vowel uh, on the front and an even number on the back, right? Which of the two cards will test this rule? A. Why do you think so? Cool. So so this is where it's it's called confirmation bias. So ultimately. We are drawn to you know the details where which is sort of confirming you. So you think A is a A is a you know vowel, right? So it confirms okay A is a vowel. Let me just test it. If the backside is uh, is an even number, I test it. But the other way to do it, why don't you go and test the other one? If you pick seven, seven is an odd number, and if you flip it, right, and it it doesn't turn out to be a vowel, it'll you know fail the test. So we don't look for negative sort of tests, but we look for positive one. So this is also, you know, one of the big bias which is actually most common uh, at play. So every time you have a, you know, you think this feature is going to work, suddenly you start gathering data to just make that work, even though it is not working. So, so the whole point is, how do you objectively look at the data and then decide and do some negative tests? Okay, if if this is the data at play, what else can I bring in which sort of falsifies this? So you think sort of like a scientist and you know try to fail it, uh, and then it starts to sort of you know become a little more clearer. Right. So there are a bunch of biases which which sort of conform to this shortcut, uh, you know, from the way. Okay. The other one, you know, obviously uh, I'm going to skip some of those. Uh, same. If there's too much information, we start finding faults in people, uh, and we think, you know, what we're not wrong. I think those guys is wrong. Uh, you know, the guy who thinks a little more, you know, black is this is wrong. But I'm not biased. But uh, you know, ultimately, that's a bias blind spot which most of us have. So the point is, how do you rationally look at that and you know then make your decisions around that? Cool. So the second shortcut brain makes is, you know, if there's not enough meaning, how do we make sense of some of those things that are coming up, right? So we find stories and patterns that sort of, you know, in within the worst sort of possible different data, we suddenly start to think, okay, something is happening. Uh, I see this data, and then suddenly you start to draw some pattern out of that. Even though the truth might be far from reality, and that comes up, you know, when most of the user research and you know stuff you will see, you will see some of those biases at play. I've already made up my mind that you know what this is going to work. I start asking questions. Okay, how does it? You know, do you think this will solve your problem? I mean, you have not asked fully about the problem, but you think? Do you think it will solve the problem? I mean, obviously they start, uh, you know, responding. Yeah, it will. But so it starts to go in a totally different direction. Uh, so one of the things that we definitely do is. You know, we don't talk about solutions unless everyone in the room has understood the problem space really well. So the first sort of 20 minutes of uh, any discussion is all about problem. You know, just don't bring in any solution at play. Everyone has understood the problem. What is the implication? What is the data? And then you start building the you know hypothesis saying this feature probably will start solving this problem, right? And then you know that sort of you know debiases your your thinking. We fill gaps with stereotypes, right? So typically, if you you know if you if you have to ask five features between uh, you know Android and iPhone, okay, uh, most of the normal guys, you know, if you go, it'll be very very hard for them to you know pick it up. But we don't have that information, so we look up to stereotypes. You know what? One of my friend also has this, is also called bandwagon effect. So typically, you see a huge queue before any any big releases. And people will be lying to you know sort of buy the phone because everyone else is buying as well. So we start to group think uh, you know in in a certain way. So one of the way also to sort of debias is to objectively look at it and say is this at play and uh, what can we do about that? All right, what is this one? So 
so we 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 look at the cigarette packet all the time right it says cigarette smoking is injurious to health we ignore that because someone in our family has been you know alive till 100 she's been smoking all the way so it's not going to happen to me come on you know this, there's no chance even though this you know the probability wise it is totally different but we start to think you know in that direction uh, so most you know, and, and this is played big time so people know uh, you know that this bias will be at play so they could leverage as well so you know the thing is how do you objectively look at the probability uh, what is the probability for something like this to happen uh, and if it is equal you can't bias certain decisions you know in in, in the others favor right so so our brain sort of simplifies probability because we can't measure it uh, sorry okay. all right uh, so uh, then certain thing you know are uh, yeah, i'm going to skip some of those so there is there are hindsight bias uh, there is uh, you know the third category is the brain has to act pretty fast i'm going to rush through some of those and come to conclusion uh, in and some of those and in this case you have both questions already out of time All right so if our you know so one of the thing if you've seen the reality shows have you seen some of the guys who go and think that they are an amazing singer and when you listen to their voice they say what was this guy smoking why did he even go there uh, that's called you know dunning trigger effect so ultimately uh, you know our, our mind is hacked you know their mind has been hacked in some way uh, where they now start to think that you know what i i can sing pretty well and suddenly that overconfidence starts building up uh, and you know obviously you know and so it has a sort of a curve where they are at the peak and then they have suddenly you know sort of delusion about this they go out do something and they start you know in a despair uh, and end up with depression and you know all sorts of things this one sure so uh, this is a mental shortcut where uh, you know ultimately uh, see in some way it is a it is a bias it's not with everyone but in some case you acquire a skill and pretty soon you start to think that you know what you're good at it you're really good at it uh, and and then you start to go and, and in case there are folks that play which sort of group thing and you know they'll say oh yeah you you're really good and suddenly you you are at the epitome of your you know confidence even though your skill level is not objectively grown uh, and and then it starts to you know play havoc and and we see it all the time right i mean you might think that i'm just going to give it a try in the reality show but uh, if you've seen the show how do you compare yourself with those persons you know and that benchmark and suddenly your reality is distorted on that right any anything anything else you had in mind Cool. Uh, then there are other, uh, you know, bunch of things. So, so I mean, there are some of the. So ultimately, some of this is about numbers. So, you know, if you give it a reward, and there are a bunch of, you know, so I'm going to leave that deck uh, to you guys. You could study each of them. Uh, I know. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Probably I'll, I'll skip one or two. Uh, just pick one or two. The the last one is if there's not enough memory. Okay. Sure. Yeah, the last one in the room is always like trouble. <laughs> cool. So, uh, so there are so ultimately there are those four buckets. If you right, okay, sure. All right. No, I'm sure. Look, so so we can discuss it. Probably open. <laughs> cool. So. Uh, I mean the, the key thing that you can derive is those four shortcuts so if it is you know not enough if there's too much of information what what is at play so you sort of look at it objectively if it's not enough evidence at play and you know the context is missing how do you make sense of it and those biases will keep coming into play uh, third is decision to you know sort of act fast how do you act fast on that and then you know memory what do you memorize some of the things for example uh, you know I'm going to pick uh, negative bias right so a lot of you know you would know that a lot of deep negative you know evidences also you know are sort of if you associate with them you you tend to sort of you know have it longer time in your memory so a lot of time what will be remembered by the brain is not about how old it is but about how much impact does it have uh, so you know one of the uh, so I was uh, watching a TED talk and one of the hack some of them do if you really want to remember something pick out a sort of totally different object and associate with it right there uh, so next time when you go down the memory lane you you will think about that object and suddenly you will recall more 
than by not associating it, right? So some of those hacks could really help you in, in memorizing more, but also to sort of use this in your product decisions to, you know, sort of make sure that you're associating something with uh, while building your product that customers would remember and, and therefore would be able to recall. All right, uh, I'm going to add one last one. Okay. So there are some more, uh, uh, you know, examples that I would lead out uh, in case you guys want. Just a joke. So ultimately, uh, so this is uh, what is called, uh, you know, uh, the, sorry. So, I mean, ultimately, one of the examples that I was giving is most of us think we are not biased, uh, but obviously the biases are at play uh, and you're going to be sort of aware about that. Okay, so what do we make out of this? So just one or two slides on the key conclusion, how sort of brain starts to act. Uh, first thing we discussed that there's too much information. So a lot of noise suddenly starts to become signal to your brain that you know what, you know, something is play and, and subconsciously it is, it is becoming a signal. If it is not enough meaningful thing, uh, that signal ultimately becomes a story. So you will, you know, go to a room and someone say, you know what, I was talking to this customer, this was happening. Now that signal of what customer gave suddenly becomes a story uh, that is being told without fact because you're not questioning it. Uh, and that story uh, suddenly leads to a certain decision that, you know what, we should go and do AI, machine learning. You've heard that? Because, you know, if you, if you go about that path, this is exactly what is happening. You know, someone went to a conference, looked at AI blockchain, you know, oh yeah, this is, you know, that's a signal. You should be doing that. Uh, because that same guy in the similar other company is doing it. Then come back, tell your team, suddenly team is prepped up. That's, you know, ultimately leads to a new practice being created. Uh, you know, the uh, most of the companies now have AI blockchain practice. Uh, what they're doing is different thing. Uh, ultimately, once, once that decision is done, it sort of affects our, you know, mental model uh, in the brain. And therefore, you know, you, you think, okay, this is how the decision is made. So therefore now, you know, the next time you're in the same situation, you'll take similar decisions, right? Cool. Now, one of the shortfall of all of this mental jugar is this. Since we don't, we selectively, we're filtering out tons of information. Obviously, every time we are leaving out something. And that something could be important, right? So therefore, when you're looking at the data, you, you, you start looking at, is there anything that we're missing out? And it's just that small step. Uh, you know, or, or certain questions. So we have, uh, at least I could share it later, we could we build a sort of checklist for some of the decision making on product, uh, which our guys used, uh, you know, and which sort of drives them or at least points them to one of these biases. Uh, and it just acts as a check, you know, they might not know about the biases, but it acts as a check. Uh, second thing is, you know, our search for meaning, you know, sort of starts to fill in the gap. So ultimately, if you look at it, there's tons of mm -hmm. memories and, and some fact will start filling in it and later, you know, that becomes sort of a, you know, signal that brain will always remember, uh, you know, on, on part of that. Uh, so, uh, quick decisions, anything when you're doing, a, you know, quickly, uh, obviously could be flawed. So, if you remember that system one is at play, stop back, think about it more, put pros and cons and switch to system two is, you know, where uh, some of these will start to work. All right. So, obviously, you know, the key thing for, for me and, and if it could be you for as a product manager, since you are responsible for tons of decisions, Knowing some of these biases will start helping you in, in your day to day decision making. Obviously, there's no tonic, no shot for debiasing your brain. Uh, so all you could, you know, do is sort of learn about each uh, and see how is that is working for you. Uh, so, I mean, ultimately, because of that decisions, you, you know, you ultimately will help uh, in, in, in uh, doing more innovation or design work. All right. Uh, two or three steps which I've put, obviously. Uh, you know, how do you make system two? I've already covered that. How do you make system two to do all the work? Uh, the other one, the technique really works is if you come across a bias and you sort of observe something, uh, and there's an association in your mind, uh, how do you consciously disassociate yourself with that fact? Uh, and that starts to sort of change, you know, your, your biases, uh, right? So, I mean, every time if you would have said something, you know what, he's such a bad driver. And then think back, okay, why are you sort of associating, you know, yourself? Is there a fact? Is there a data to support it? Uh, and you know that starts to then next time I think you will you will notice that it's the impact is lesser and slowly your your mind is trained to do, do different things. Uh, it's no brainer. All right. The other one uh, for product obviously is to build multiple hypotheses. So you know if you have one feature, uh, think of two or three hypotheses and say you know what if we do this, this is going to happen. If you do this, this is going to happen. That way you will 
you will not be biased towards just one thing uh, and, and end up doing it. So if you have three, two, three or hypothesis, then probably one of it will work and you will have a choice to you know, sort of make this out. All right. So being aware really helps. Visit the graveyard, I've said, because most of the decisions, if you go uh, in hindsight and reflect on it, uh, how did you arrive at that conclusion, which starts to sort of impact that part. Uh, challenge biases openly. Uh, most of us, you know, right from racism to everything we, we, we face on a day-to-day -day basis, but we don't challenge them. Uh, how, if you start challenging them, probably the other person as well will become aware uh, and therefore he will do something about it. So, so I mean, if, if you see this, this four, uh, in fact, this is the you know recent one, uh, you know, the guy's done. So ultimately, these four back buckets, uh, thinking in these four buckets will really start to help. Uh, and for each of those, you know, one or two is is good enough. So there are like ten to fifteen that probably you know I could uh, append here, which ultimately will will start to help. But ultimately, it's not about you can just suddenly change. Some of this is is more about mindfulness, more about you know doing some of those things to step back and and look at it. And a lot of times just by knowing them that that is at play and just thinking about it itself slowly will build that up. All right, uh, diversity. I mean, you know, we, we, we talk about diversity, but one of the way diversity really helps is because it brings in a different point of view. Uh, and once you have a different point of view, the decisions are much different than you know what it was. All right. Uh, so what do you get when you combine cognitive bias with inaccurate information? I'm sure you have all your roadmaps out there. Uh, so, so go and challenge that and see if it changes anything. Uh, these three things definitely, I mean, out of all the books, uh, this has really helped me. Uh, so I'm sure you guys can go and pick it up and uh, read through. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, all the slides uh, in the conference will be available on the website right next to the talks. You know, probably in two or two, one or two days. I could add that, sure. Yeah, I could add it in the deck. All right. Thank you.